Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I appreciate so much for being here for the first talk in our last day here. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm Evelyn Gomez. I'm from Red Hat team, uh, from support engineer for OpenShift, dedicated to OpenShift. And I've been doing this for the last six, five, six years. And as a support engineer uh, in OpenShift, I basically eat issues for breakfast every day. So over the time, it actually you start to see a few trends or common issues for particular situations. So why Sherlock or Cesar de on the stock? This is because this is the place that I need to be when troubleshooting issues. And also is what I need to help our customers um, to also develop it in themselves when, you're, when they are the sysadmin of the, of the OpenShift cluster. Or for a matter of fact, any cluster, uh, any Kubernetes cluster, this talk is actually quite agnostic. So whatever I'm talking here, um, there are similar situations that happens in Kubernetes world in our community. Uh, I see a lot in Telegram chats, Reddit, <laughs> whenever there is a Kubernetes cluster running, right? So the specific situation that uh, we're going to cover here um, is troubleshooting issues and also actually performance issues. This kind of issues happens in a particular situation. So this is a Kubernetes cluster when they're in their first moment of life. It's quite simple. You can see everything. Pods are simple enough. Microservices is still not quite, um, let's say, messy. It's quite um, simple to visualize everything, right? Problem starts to begin when it becomes this. So this is when you have like a, lo a lot of workload. You have network policies on there. You have automation, which is great. And it is actually like the natural evolution of a Kubernetes cluster. You want to get into that point. But again, problem happens usually in the middle of this transition. So what I hope to bring here on this talk is how to troubleshoot or even how to prevent issues when we're coming from a, a little cluster and become like a very busy cluster, a production cluster, and you're actually doing like nice things with GitOps and Tecton and pipelines, whatever you want to uh, really work with in the long term. So I was saying there is a little, a few trendy issues when we're going through this transition, and those are usually how to troubleshoot issues or outages on the fly. Because when you have like a big cluster on this transition, it, when you have an issue, it can start to be a little bit more difficult or a little bit more complex on how on where to pinpoint or, or how to trace it, these issues. Also, what to keep an eye on. So there are a few things that I would say that are crucial to monitor. There are a lot of good, great uh, monitoring tools, but there are a few specific things that I would like to highlight that uh, if you're administering a Kubernetes cluster, you want to make sure that you uh, understand how it is um, the behavior around the, along the time. Also, I uh, we're going to talk a little bit about tools to facilitate problem solving in the long term. Because um, when we're using a, a Kubernetes cluster or OpenShift, we want to have that. We don't want to sometimes to recreate. We want to have uh, this long-term uh, cluster up and running, and from time to time, of course, doing man maintenance. But uh, for that, we also need to use a few specific tools. So basically, in our agenda, uh, well, We'll talk a little bit about the background. We'll talk a little bit about the detective mindset, which is uh, specific, specific for my field. Um, you need, um, when issues are arising, 
you need to handle that on the fly. And this is not only for me, but also for, again, for anybody that needs to, that's working as a CZ me, you actually have to have that, that detective mindset to help to resolve the issue as, as, as soon as possible. Then we talk a, a little bit about our crime scene, which is, of course, like a use case scenario. It's a, a real story. We talk a little bit about uh, a few tools that could be helpful and the relevant information. And this is from the application side, and then we'll go over through a cluster perspective. During my talk, there, are, there will be a lot of links that I put for later reference. I plan to make this available um, in the DevConf uh, a website for everybody. So just, um, I, I will not cover every little aspect, but I, I made sure that there were links to, so you can refer later on. So the detective mindset, what is that? So it's nature, nothing but human nature when we have an outage of an application or basically a, the, a cluster outage, an application outage is to react and go and troubleshoot and find out what, what is the culprit. But I'm here actually to say to don't panic. And this is extremely helpful because when you're on the issue, you actually need to take a step back to take notes. And there are three specific things that I would like to highlight uh, that is important to take notes. First being timestamp and time zone. And this is especially because Kubernetes cluster or OpenShift, OpenShift is special, it runs always in UTC, right? This is the fault time zone. But when we're handling with different, with different teams or cross collaborating, the teams, they are in different regions. And it's very easy to get uh, confused with that. So this is the first thing. Whenever you have like um, uh, a report of an issue, make sure that you get like, the time zone and the, and, and the timestamp. This will really help on the long term when you need to get a postmortem or an RCA, and this is very easily um, overseen but it helps so much when, when you need, again, uh, do a, a proper RCA or to cross-reference with a lot of data. There was uh, this time that I was troubleshooting an issue with auto scaling, and I was actually able to find a bug in the code just by uh, cross-reference with timestamps and in the logs. The problem was, is that at the first minute, the timestamp that was given to me it was a different time zone. <laughs> it was not UTC. So I spent a lot of time looking at the, right, at the wrong set of, of data and, and metrics. So having this, uh, this important always like in the back of our mind where you're collaborating uh, with your, your team, it's especially important and it avoids a lot of confusion. Node name and pod name, this is also great uh, information to have if you can on the fly uh, when, you, when you have to resolve an issue. Again, I'm focusing in the postmortem uh, approach if I need it. So if I have those information at hand, I can quickly check, okay, so this happened, and I can do correlations about where possibly the issue started. And this is the third uh, and last part for on the, the tech mindset that uh, I see that it's a lot important, and this is not only for me, but also we, you can see like the same approach in the Google uh, SRE book. It's stop the bleeding first. It's easy to get in that mindset of we have the issue, uh, we need to find our CA, we need to resolve it, but uh, what is the culprit? The thing is that if we don't resolve the issue first, uh, like our customers are really um, losing money because we need to restart the service. That doesn't make RCA or postmortem less important. Of course not. That's uh, ideal to have. But this approach actually it's important in the long term. If you have actually it's relevant and easier to be achieved 
if you do have the proper tools uh, in the first place. And we'll talk a little bit more about that with our examples. Sometimes also uh, this talk, uh, I talk a lot of our customers, I talk a lot uh, with well, sometimes even managers, you know, so uh, sometimes it can be like a tricky um, conversation uh, because we need to answer for a lot of, of stakeholders, for our, our customers, the customer of our customer, for everybody. But as long as we have the tools in the first place for observability, this should be just fine and it's so much easier to achieve. So that said, with all these three things in mind, let's take a look on two uh, real scenarios that happen that one of them, in this case, the application, in the application uh, layer, there was not um, the stop the bleeding, stop the issue first. Actually, it had, but didn't have the, the, the RCA first. So let's take a look on the evidences. So when we, talk, what we, when we were talking or tackling this issue, we, f we saw three specific things. One, that the application was not serving requests, and this was unpredictable. We didn't really could know like, how and why. Second, we saw that from time to time, the pod would crash loop with on oh, oh. So it was being killed. And also, the pod also had three replicas. So it, well, there was some... Um, um, it was widespread, right? So those were, were the only evidence that we had. But again, how, how we solve it? We solve it by increasing the, the pods from three to six and by implementing out the scale. But let me just get back to this slide because this was like a big outage because the application was not serving the request uh, that our customer was expecting to. But we didn't know how or why. We simply resolved it being fast by increasing the, the pods because we saw, well, there is some memory issue because it's being on on. But that does not actually answer why this is actually happening. The bad part on this is that <laughs> because there were no metrics in the application, we could not see what was really causing. So this is a good example about uh, when we can resolve uh, the issue, but when we don't have the proper tools, it, it gets hard to see the RCA. So let me talk a little bit about a long-term solution when there is a big focus on our RCA. If your business, if, especially if your business have that um, critical policy. So one of them is aggregator logging system. And this is, um, the three of those actually, you can achieve with OpenShift. It comes pretty much like out of the box. But they're also uh, totally open source um, uh, plugins that you can attach to a Kubernetes cluster. The nice part of those is that they, you can actually uh, extend, you can actually collect the, all the pods, logs, you can collect the infra uh, logs, the audits if you need it as well. And you want that. We want that because if a pod fails, just like happened before, we can actually trace back. Okay, so let me see what happened for this pod in the past. And, and try to correlate the events. And again, we can try trace back timestamp and uh, things like that. Another thing uh, that's super important, it's application metrics. And this is super nice with open telemetry. There will be a talk, I think, later today on this. I super recommend to also uh, keep an eye on that. Open telemetry is a big project, open source project, and it helps so much have application metrics. It, it can it can actually prevent you, once you have the data of your application, you can actually prevent or predict certain, certain issues, especially if, slow, if it is load related. Um, a third, a long-term solution, it's load testing. This is actually 
um, commonly overseen. And this is especially, I, I actually think more than never, because we are in a so fast-paced world, or we need to, to deliver and, and update all the time our applications, we need to have load testing. This will actually make better performance in a Kubernetes world because you can predict and set requests and limits appropriately. So then again, this prevents outage and unavailability issues with their application. The last one that I'd like to highlight here is Kubelinter. This is a super cool uh, tool, also open source. It's like a static tool that you install and you can really um, run against your deployment YAML uh, as a developer, right? So with that, you can have actually have cloud native recommendations, things like, do you have request and limit set? Do you have any toleration or tense that you need to take care about it? How many replicas do you have? If you have one, the Kubernetes will say, okay, so you probably should have three. And the most interesting part of this uh, particular uh, tool is because it's also highly cost, uh, customizable. So you can apply your own uh, rules to it. So you can have like all the developers following this uh, same template, uh, we can say. So it's a very powerful tool. It, uh, it helps to prevent a lot of issues, uh, things like um, if, you, if you had maybe a node outage and you had pods running that node, the, uh, the pod will be evicted, right? But if you only have one replica, well, that's a common scenario that, we, that you should have like at least two or three, ideally five, <laughs> right? And those are, are all uh, issues that can be prevented with those uh, set of tools. So this is actually a, a demonstration from Kibana. And, uh, if you ever deal with Kibana, I personally like a lot. Uh, it's easy uh, enough to navigate. It shows like the host, the phone name. Of course, like every logging system, it will show the same, but I particularly like uh, the Kibana interface. This is uh, a picture from a Quarkus application because Quarkus does have by nature metrics exposure. So what I did here, this is, uh, this is actually from OpenShift, I create a service monitor to communicate with Prometheus and expose it, the metrics from Quarkus directly in the OpenShift uh, monitoring system. So this, uh, this is a good example to, that, you can, that you would be able to see if there were actually like requests increasing what, what was really happening in the application level, right? Because sometimes all we have is resource usage, like memo memory, CPU, and that doesn't really count the whole, tells us the whole story. So having things like this, uh, it really helps in the, in the long run. Things to keep an eye that I would like to, to highlight here uh, on, this, on this part of, of deployments. First is pod capabilities. This is, uh, I would <laughs> say, like a hidden issue usually because a pod, it, it can have all these capabilities. Uh, you can have kill, um, um, and kill actually is the most dangerous <laughs> one here, but it can have. Uh, and these are configurable. So one thing that I would say that you need to make sure uh, that your pod, if your pod has, that you know about it. Because if you have like a demo set or any pod that has this area of capability, it will likely cause an issue some, someday in the cluster. You know? And just make sure that you know which pods have those capabilities. It's a, a, a often issue that happens and because, especially because those assume the, those capabilities, they communicate in the kernel level and it is known in, in Kubernetes to cause a, f a few issues depending on how this pod behaves. 
Okay. A second thing that I would like to say to that is important to keep an eye is the quality of service, which, which is calls. Um, what is calls? Oh, sorry, I, I missed to put up a picture on this. But quality of service is also a field that you put in the pod, or as a matter of fact, a, a container, and it tells you if it's guarantee or if um, best effort. It, in summary, it really will tell you when or what is the priority of the pod if the node gets into an overcommitted situation. This is also very often overseen, but that's something that you want to know uh, about your pod, especially the most critical applications that you have. What is his uh, quality of service? If I hit an issue with the node, would my, my application be the one to be guaranteed to stick in the node and avoid uh, an outage or avoid at least the loss of one replica for a, a, a time? So uh, those are things that, that I would recommend to keep an eye uh, if you have in your cluster. The second crime scene is uh, a scenario that happened with a cluster. And we had a few evidences uh, on this issue. First one, and the most, um, I think, that was the most perceptible or the most noticeable, was that the cluster was getting slow. Like it, when you run cube control commands, you get a slow response, or when you open like the console, it just it's not working quite well. So that was one evidence. Second, no garbage collection. Actually, when trying um, spinning up a pod with deployment, if uh, the pod was being deployed, the problem was that when I deleted the deployment, the pod was not going away. So I actually remember, I actually discovered that we're having garbage collection issues, right? This is handled by the cube managed controller. And well, that's a second evidence on this cluster. Third one, the etcd pod was flipping up and down. I could see uh, the availability of, of that CD, and that's never a good, <laughs> that's never a good hint in your cluster. You don't want to have a Kubernetes cluster having like <laughs> unavailability on that CD. And fourth, when check at CD messages, I was actually seeing requests took too long to execute. If we were having issues alone with etcd, usually this message means that etcd is performing badly. But not only that, like you can go like in many ways on this. But the main, the main hint is that something is not wrong and it's behaving for poorly. This could be because of disk, slow disk, that's a very common situation uh, in Kubernetes depending on, what, on which uh, type of, of storage disk you're putting on, it can behave poorly. That, that's a situation. But again, going back to our evidence, those are the ones that we had for this issue. Another set of evidence is that the Kube API server was going up to 40 gigas of resource usage memory. That's a lot. And when talking to the customer and really seeing the context of the, uh, of the cluster, it was not um, expected. It was just too much. Like this was, this was taking a lot of resource from the memory, from, from the control plane node. So what is happening here? So when you're running like a, a simple grab looking for air holes, we actually found like over 37,000 messages of errors about a specific operator that were there. And many of those messages, not all of them, but was about this issue with, uh, uh, with certificate that was unable to see, uh, to parse bytes as pain block. So because Kubernetes is so great and we have a great community, there was actually a very similar issue reported for a different uh, operator, but it was reported. And that's why I, I love Kubernetes, you know, uh, it's a very vocal 
um, humanity. And what happened in, in that specific situation is that in the CRD of the operator installed there, there was this dummy value that when the Kube API server was trying to hit it, the kubelet was not really accepting it and was spammy and overheading the Kube API server, making it to that high memory usage. Oh, sorry. Okay, just a minute. All right. So the way that we resolve it, it was basically remove that dummy value and that instantaneously made everything work again. <laughs> like Kube API server went down. Uh, there was a, an evidence that I missed on putting it on this slide, but there were over 400 terminating projects, projects that were just hanging there. And also we resolved the issue with the Kube API server. It all went away. The cluster started to behave better. Uh, there was nothing hanging, like etcd normalized again, it was not uh, going up and down from uh, an hour to another. So this is something that I would like to highlight, like the QB API server, like the core of a uh, Kubernetes cluster is something that you really want to make sure uh, that is behaving properly, but not only that, that you really understand the routine of the QB API server. So long-term solution for this kind of issues, uh, performance issues uh, in specific, is cluster metrics. You want to make sure that you have those, uh, that you understand uh, what is the normality on the cluster. Kube API performance metrics, those are great uh, metrics to have. It, it is uh, available with Grafana and Prometheus, which uh, for any Kubernetes administrator, it's uh, pretty much the best, uh, best friend. Right? Etcd metrics, this is super cool because uh, etcd actually exposed the metrics. In OpenShift, you have that by default. You actually have like API perform metrics dashboard. Uh, you have that CD uh, metrics by default. And I want to add here very quickly um, a little bit about Valero. Uh, I, how many of you know Valero? All right, so Valero, uh, it's a tool for backing up Kubernetes resource, especially persistent volumes. So that's uh, one thing that is not really related to, <laughs> to performance issue, but I wanted to present here just because it's so powerful and it helps so much just in case the worst happen, <laughs> you know, in the disaster recovery scenario, you want to make sure that you have your applications properly back up. And Valero is super easy, super simple, and very powerful. In OpenShift, we actually have that uh, Valero with OATP, which is another operator, which runs like Valero behind the scenes. So how it looks like? So this is um, a dashboard from Kube API server and also from etcd. Those are good things uh, to to really monitor and understand how it goes up, or how it goes out, if there are any spikes or if there is not. A uh, lot of cluster performance issues when they are growing, as I was saying before, it's mostly related to those components. Cube API, add CD. Maybe the control plane is too, is too little, maybe the, the nodes are, are too little and needs some resizing. But uh, in order to predict that, you can actually like refer to such, uh, such metrics. A very cool comment that I, that I use, um, in case you don't have like at CD uh, metrics, is this one. You actually can see the amount of objects uh, in the at CD uh, that are stored in the at CD database. And this is quite cool, you know, uh, especially if you, if you're trying to, co to build a baseline, you actually can, if you, and you notice, again, cluster performance issues, 
sometimes you can easily see the response like on this. And you will see like, I don't know, maybe 30,000 events, uh, 2,000 um, config maps, you know, any odd behavior like that, uh, it's probably worth to investigate. Thank you, that's it uh, that I have to share. Um, any questions? Yes? So for the second case that you showed, wouldn't a long-term solution call for be to submit a patch or PR for the faulty operator? Because the root cause was a, a, a bad certificate or something like that. Maybe. Okay, so <laughs> the question was if one of the, the possible solutions was to report a PR to the to the operator to the better operator or submit a patch yourself. a patch yeah uh, or submit a patch yeah possibly uh, i would say that we need like at least a little bit more uh, or investigation or at least try to reproduce but yeah like a, a long term solution of course yeah, we want to report uh, that issue about the operator true yes Can you say that again? Uh, in the story, you said that the problems that make the cluster go slow um, only show from time to time when SCB was flipping. Like Do you know why that happens? I mean, is there some backdrop mechanism that was overloaded? And then it happens? All right, OK. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the question was if I know um, if it was a uh, mechanism in SCD, what it caused that, right? So in that scenario, what happened is because the issue actually lives in QB API server. And because QB API server is the only one that talks with etcd, it was, it, the ad, uh, QB API service was just too overheaded. And it was not able to communicate with etcd properly. So it's like a, a, an overhead of an overhead. <laughs> and that's what makes like etcd start to be a little bit um, not stable. You know, but it was like the main culprit is QB API server because uh, QB API server, it talks with every component in the cluster, but he's the, he is the only one that talks with etcd. So uh, like, uh, it's like the bottleneck on that. Yeah. Did I answer your question? <laughs> Great. All right, uh, I think we can wrap. All right, thank you so much uh, for coming.